around you. They are Johnston and Gil Sands. In this programme, we will reveal how these typefaces have been scripting our lives for decades. Created by two unlikely and influential characters, one of whom had his reputation overshadowed by disturbing revelations about his personal life. This is the story of Edward Johnston and Eric Gill and their two types of Britain. Words are all around us, everywhere we turn, guiding us, informing us and tempting us. But every word surrounding us is in a typeface. I'm Mark Ovenden, and you might say I'm a bit of a typeface enthusiast. Yes, they really do exist. And why not? Typefaces are so important and shape the way we see the world, something I've always found fascinating. Typefaces nowadays are usually and wrongly referred to as fonts. A font actually depicts the size and weight of letters, whereas the typeface is the important bit, letter design. Choosing the right typeface for text is more important than you might think, because how lettering looks conveys the emotion of the word. Imagine how differently we might perceive all sorts of important messages and brands if they were in the wrong typeface. As we rumble around on public transport, we're constantly bombarded by messages for products or services. But how can we differentiate between the crucial signs that tell us where to get off the train or where to go on holiday? We may think that we're quite sophisticated, but actually how we spot the difference is the result of good design and really clever typography. But it wasn't always like that. In the early 1900s, London and its traffic were growing at an alarming rate. To counter this problem, the underground was expanding, with new tunnels deep below the West End. And extended lines reaching further out to the suburbs. Paid advertising on the tube station walls was nothing new and a useful source of additional income. But it was all becoming a bit chaotic. Enamel and hand-painted signs and fly posting were the equivalent of today's website pop-ups or endless advert breaks on the telly. And at railway stations, especially those of the underground, these ads littered every available wall. The underground was already in the midst of a redesign. Architect Leslie Green had created an arts and crafts inspired decorative feel to many of the new stations in 1906. But this had not solved the signage and advertising confusion. Much of this work is still visible and has also been preserved in pristine condition in now unused parts of the underground. Well, Mike, it's great to be down in these abandoned tunnels underneath Piccadilly Circus. Can you tell us something about the signage we can still see here? Indeed, what you're looking at here is signage that dates from the opening of this station in, in 1906, when the Bakerloo and Piccadilly lines opened here. Um, and, of course, this is one of the traditional ceramic letter tiling in this slightly serif typeface design by Leslie Green, the architect who built these stations. Um, but, of course, it's really very contemporary of that period. It's a slightly soft arts and crafts typeface. These little arrows, particularly, are probably the giveaway in some respects. A serif is a small flourish at the end of a letter, rather like the stroke of a brush. The underground was using this style of serif lettering on much of the railway signage. But a typeface which was different at every station didn't make the network look unified. 
They were obviously trying a simple, similar style of lettering, but didn't quite manage actually to get consistency across their stations. And I think that was due to the fact that several different manufacturers made these ceramic tiles, so I think there was a subtle variation. But they're simple. The way they're laid out and the use of the lettering on them that actually allows a consistency of approach and legibility, and at the same time subliminally delivering the brand. Frank Pick was in charge of publicity for the London Underground Group at this time. After years of signs being made in a variety of serifs and sans serifs by the many companies running services, he realised that customers could not clearly differentiate between the station signage and adverts for other companies, as it was all in this chaotic mix of styles. Frank Pick intended to change this. Pick began to commission scores of commercial artists, what we would now call graphic designers, to come up with posters to extol the virtues of using the tube in off-peak times, to explore London's edges, or to come into the West End for their shopping. But he knew that he wanted the lettering to be really distinctive, to stand out from the graphic noise of all the advertising, to be straightforward, clear, and in his words, Manly. A lot of the designs, specifically on the advertising posters that were commissioned early on, were beginning to stand out in this style. One from 1908 highlights much of Frank Pick's vision, a bright, confident poster showcasing all the essential elements of taking the underground. Here you have those red brick tiles of Leslie Green, the underground logo with the large U and the big D. There's even a silhouette of London in there and the map and a couple of catchphrases. But the problem was all the lettering was different. It just didn't look like a unified organisation. However, everything was about to change. Because a lot of the stations were styled by this arts and crafts based design, much of the typography used at the stations and by advertisers of the day were in a serif. Frank Pick had the idea to radically change the lettering to a sans serif, which meant removing the decorative kicks from the characters. He wanted a typeface that would be instantly associated with the underground, wherever it appeared, so every time you saw it, you knew where you were. Since the sans serif he envisaged did not exist at that time, he had no option. He would have to commission one for himself. Luckily for Pick, London was buzzing with creativity in the early 1900s, and a young man whose passion was the ancient art of calligraphy was about to catch his eye. His name? Edward Johnston. At this time, Johnston was lecturing calligraphy at Central School of Art and Design in London. Catherine, what was Johnston's lecturing style like? By all accounts, he was a real showman. We have a set of photographs taken by one of his students that just shows his blackboards absolutely packed full of kind of letter forms and different styles of letters, some really quite flamboyant and exuberant ones. So you just kind of get a sense of the richness of what it must have been to have been a part of those classes, yeah. Edward Johnston was also known in the arts and crafts circuit. And it was here where he met Frank Pick, who was fascinated by his work. Given that he was a calligrapher, that was quite an odd choice for Frank Pick to choose him, really, wasn't it, for this modern sans serif he wanted? I do wonder whether or not um, Pick took a punt on Johnston. I mean, he was an odd choice. He was embarking on something new. He wasn't an expert. He was just opening out a territory, and I've always thought that was interesting, that he got a job as the head of something and he wasn't sort of known for it, he wasn't really established when he got that job. So I, I think it was more just maybe a sense of excitement and buzz and maybe Pick just thought, well, I wonder what he's going to bring to this job. Johnston's alphabet design for London transport was an anomaly, a complete contradiction to much of his teachings. Here was a calligrapher who taught his students by chalks, quill and ink, producing this radically neat style of block letters without serifs. 
but he still managed to encapsulate some sneakily placed calligraphic touches to many of the letters. When you have a broad edge pen and you go to draw a dot of an eye, and of course it ends up a, <laughs> it's a diamond shape. There's your comma. So the punctuation, the tittle as we call them, was really formed from Johnson's background as a calligrapher, really. Yeah, absolutely. His knowledge of a pen and the tool and actually how you start to shape letters. And it still is what gives Johnston sounds that a real distinctiveness. So the way Johnson was doing it with a couple of chalks glued together is still relevant to type designers today. Yeah, absolutely, but not just type designers. I mean, I'd say anybody that's working with with typefaces, and who isn't? We're all using fonts on our computers every day. It's just the most easy way to demonstrate the relationship between tool and letter form. Students can identify straight away with it. Also, you can rub it out. <laughs> From 1916, Edward Johnston's new and very different lettering was adopted for publicity material across the London underground. It wasn't the first sans serif invented during this time, but it was the first to base its letters on Roman square proportions, focusing on the narrow width of the strokes. A feeling of progress was in the air, a desire to clear up the mess of the past and build a brave new world. Unification of London's transport system was already well on the way. In 1916, a man named Frank Pick, on behalf of the new Underground Railway Group, had commissioned a new sans-serif typeface from one of Britain's leading typographers, Edward Johnston. The result is the clear, bold Johnston lettering that graces London's transport system, a truly 20th century achievement. The modern concept of intellectual property did not exist during this period, but the design was fiercely guarded by London transport. So much so, printers who had access to the type blocks were forbidden to use them on anything else. The typeface was a complete success, but it wasn't exactly a life-changing experience for Edward Johnston. After Johnston had delivered his first alphabets to Frank Pick, he just carried on working at Central School. He didn't really work on any other typefaces, did he? I don't think he set out to be a great type designer and I don't think he set out to be famous or to achieve in, in that kind of way. He was just really happy with his ideas, with finding out and studying lettering. Such was the success of the lettering for the underground, Johnston later went on to design a condensed version of his typeface for the bus destination boards as well. But with this new unified brand spreading across London, Pick needed assurance that no one would deviate from it. What was needed was some kind of easy to follow instruction book that everybody could copy. And that's exactly what London Transport did in 1938 with the standard signs manual. The first time corporate identity manual has ever been created for any transport organisation in the world. And here we have all the elements of what should exist on a sign. Here's the logo at the top, underneath all the station names, even including what colour each of the lines would be in. Thanks to Frank Pick's vision and Edward Johnston's style, Transport in London now had its own brand. The signage stood out from the rest of the graphic noise to form a clear and concise wayfinding system, making it a lot easier to get out. Johnston's creation defined London transport. Everywhere you looked, Johnston was looking back at you. So no matter whether your journey was from Ongar to Kilburn, you would know that the whole way would be guided by this beautiful, aesthetically pleasing Johnston typeface. London transport jealously guarded Johnston's creation in its entirety which meant London was exactly where it would stay. Johnston himself left the big smoke to work out of the small East Sussex village of Ditchling, where there is a museum showcasing much of his work. I've seen London transport posters my whole life and admired the lettering. 
but this is the first time I've ever held some of the lowercase wooden letters. And it's just fantastic to see the calligraphic influences that are brought out by some of these letters. Just look at that big swish underneath the comma and the tittle, the dot above the I, Johnston's absolutely famous diamond. And this double story or I glass G, the attention to detail, the balance that he managed to eventually work into the proportions of that G are just beautiful. This different and calligraphy-inspired design changed the way London looked forever. But where did Johnston's vision and ideas come from? To find out, I've come to meet his grandson, Andrew, to examine Edward Johnston's beginnings. He had a very strange start in life. He was born in 1872 on a ranch in Uruguay. It was a quite an unconventional sort of childhood. His father was quite a strange figure. He was from this deeply religious family, but he corresponded with Darwin. He had quite sort of revolutionary ideas that children should do what they want. The result was Edward was mainly brought up by his aunt, who was very sweet but terribly neurotic and worried all the time about him catching cold and so kept him basically indoors and his father kept him uneducated uh, for most of his childhood life, really would not think that going to a, a calligrapher, sitting at this desk, using a quill pen, how is he going to give you one of the world's best known typefaces? A most unlikely figure to then become a modern graphic designer. The very way the word is written is like the familiar voice of a friend. The look of London transport is its personality. The triumphant unified design that Johnston had transported to tubes, trams and buses wasn't just in the typeface. Frank Pick later asked him to redesign the underground logo, known as the Bullseye or Roundel. After the success of the underground type, I think Pick saw that he could do other work for him. One thing that he looked at was the Bullseye, as it was called, the solid red disc with some rather clunky sans serif lettering across it on a bar. Not an easy commission, and Pick was not an easy man to deal with, but he did succeed in producing something that Pick liked, which was to hollow out the solid disc into a ring, place the lettering on a very carefully proportioned bar, put ribbons above the lettering and below the lettering with a big U and a big D, and you've got a balanced logo that still survives to this day, really, in modified form, and was a runaway success. Johnston's designs and masterful teaching methods were inspirational to many of his students. It was in the classes at Central St Martins where a young architect turned stonecutter named Eric Gill first fell under Johnston's spell. Eric Gill was well known in art circles for much of his sketches and stone carvings. His early works had gained a lot of attention for the manner in which they contained both religious and sexual connotations. Gill attended evening classes at Central St Martin's College in London to learn another art form, calligraphy. He became transfixed by his lecturer Edward Johnston and had even assisted him on his commission for the underground. Gill remained inspired by Johnston's success and began experimenting to create his own sans serif alphabet. A friend asked him to paint a sign for a Bristol bookshop. This would effectively be the first major exposure of a new style that had never been seen outside of London. Historically, printing words in books and newspapers was a skilled craft. Typesetters assembled text by hand from individual wooden or metal letters. But in the late 1800s, a mechanical method called casting was invented that punched out the tiny letters from strips of metal. One of the key companies revolutionising this trade was called Monotype, based in Redhill in Surrey. 
To make larger, display-sized headlines for posters and adverts, they created the Supercaster, which could automatically compile letters into whole sentences from molten metal. Monotype commissioned type designers to make alphabets for their machines, then licensed the rights to use them. So every time a company used one of their typefaces on adverts or signs, Monotype would be paid a fee. But they were on the lookout for something new and exciting with a slightly art deco feel. And they were about to find it. Gill's new lettering was spotted on the bookshop sign by a consultant called Stanley Morrison, who was working for Monotype. He was keen to commission something in this style that the corporation could license. It was the dawn of Gill's new typeface that would alter the way Britain looked forever. Not bad. When working on early designs for London Underground, Johnston was aided by his student, Eric Gill famously handing him 10% of the fee for his assistance. Gill's experimental design on the Cleaverdon bookstore adopted a Johnston-inspired sans serif. He worked fast on his new commission and transposed the letters he had prepared for the shop, turning them into a fully formed alphabet. But he didn't give Johnston a penny. Here it is. This delicate piece of brown paper lives here in London's St Bride Printing Library, hand-inked by Gill himself, which shows just how revolutionary, radically clean and light his typeface was going to be compared to the old, fussy serifs of the past. All Gill and Monotype needed now was a customer, a big customer. By chance, the London North Eastern Railway, who were then the second largest train company in Britain, were looking to rebrand. Cecil Dandridge, the LNER advertising manager, had seen how the radical sans-serif design had brought clarity and authority to the London transport system. He quickly ordered the Johnston-inspired lettering of Gil Sands from Monotype to use across the entire LNER network including one of their most iconic locomotives, the Mallard. By the middle of the 1930s, the LNER had used Gilsand's typeface on every conceivable surface. And when this magnificent blue beast broke the world speed record in 1938, pictures of its nameplate in Gilsand's lettering went around the world. Gill must have been thrilled that his typeface now donned the Mallard locomotive. As a reward for the success of his work, Cecil Dandridge invited Gill aboard one of their other famous trains, the Flying Scotsman. Unlike Johnston, who had inspired his design, Gill's lettering escaped the confines of London. It's thanks to the railways that this beautifully balanced sans-serif typeface got transported to every single corner of Britain, from Land's End to John O'Groats. Well, more accurately, from Penzance to Wick, where the railways ran. It wasn't just the station signs that extolled this new design. Timetables, information posters, even the dining car menu were all printed in Gill's radical typeface. The LNER effectively popularised Gill Sands in Britain, forcing all the printing companies who work for them to buy the typeface in. And once they had it, they used it for everything else. Gill Sands was sleek, modern, streamlined, just like the record-breaking Mallard. They were a perfect match. Other mainline train companies attempted to emulate the success of the LNER's brave and smart new look, adopting Gil Sands for some of their advertising too. This made it the go-to typeface for many printing companies across the country. Well, turned out not too bad, really. 
Just look at this. It really shows the clarity of Gill's thinking in the design of this typeface. Look at that perfectly circular O. And the sloping edge of the T, a very distinctive feature of Gil Sands. A clearness and clarity of a sans serif like this had never really been seen outside of London. But how exactly did Gill's new countrywide design differ from Johnston's London based one? Gill famously said that he thought that his alphabet improved upon his master's. So it's interesting to compare the two. This is Johnston's capital R supported by a completely straight leg, almost like a piece of furniture holding up the bowl. On Gill's R, it's propped up by this wonderfully graceful sprung tail, inspired by Roman and Trajan lettering. I wonder whether maybe Gill has the edge on this letter. Looking at the Gill Sands alphabet next to the Johnston one, the untrained eye could easily mistake them as the same typeface. However, they are anything but. Gill used a lot of symmetry on his letters and numerals, like this perfectly balanced three, which could almost be an eight, chopped in half. Johnston's capital E's and F's have a much shorter middle crossbar, whereas Gill has them parallel with the top of the letter. It was exactly the straightforward clarity monotype were looking for. They were so pleased with Gill's design they ordered alternate weights and improvements to it. He went on to create several other typefaces too, although they weren't anywhere near as successful as Gil Sands. Thanks to Gil's success, Monotype wanted him on a retainer. And here's the contract. Gil shall deliver one new typeface comprising both Roman and Italic characters for the princely sum of £200 a year. Doesn't sound a lot, but in today's money, that would be more like £10,000. But by the late 1930s, Britain was at war. With the threat of Nazi invasion, rationing and austerity were starting to bite. In an attempt to boost morale, an accessible and straightforward typeface was required to use on much of the spirit-lifting propaganda and information posters. A type that most of the printing companies already had easy access to. Gil Sands. Edward Johnston and Eric Gill both passed away, having witnessed their creations dominate the British landscape. Gill, who had remained in the public eye for most of his working life, died of lung cancer in 1939. Johnston, who had largely retired from public view, died in his home in Ditchling in 1944. But the fruits of their work were very much still alive, turning them both into cult figures in the arts and crafts world. However, Johnston and Gill, although close friends and clearly inspirational to each other, could not have been more different. The contrasts are evident when examining some of the sculpture and drawings created by Gill throughout his life. He was, on the surface, a deeply creative and highly respected figure in religious and artistic circles. But behind closed doors, Gill lived a life of sexual obsession that mirrored much of his art. Gill wasn't a straightforwardly moralistic person. I believe he was genuinely religious, but his personal life was extremely complex. Cultural historian Fiona McCarthy began researching Eric Gill in the 1980s for a biography on his intricate artworks and uncovered details of his morally destructive life. A lot of the work is religious in content, but then there's this underlying sense of the erotic because Gill was passionately interested in sex and one gets this sort of curious balance in his work. He was a very bizarre person, very extreme person, um, but fascinating to study. 
He was working on Prospero and Ariel in the 1930s, the great well-known carving outside the BBC building. And he was by then really very much in the public eye. And people were seeing him up there on the scaffold because he was a hand carver. Gill couldn't decide whether he wanted to be this humble workman or a superstar. Yeah, he, he was against commerce, but then took lucrative contracts. He was profoundly religious, but deeply immoral. So he is quite a hard character to get the grips with. I think Gill couldn't resist being a celebrity. He had this um, longing for um, public adulation, but he also couldn't resist shocking people. He'd make, you know, wild statements about politics and uh, sex and um, man's most precious ornament, which was, of course, his penis. Um, he, he couldn't resist the controversy. Fiona gained access to the archive of Gill's personal effects, including his diary. And the disturbing self-confessed entry she found there were to shock the public and tarnish much of his work thereafter. I found a lot about the private Gill because he was very uninhibited in what he wrote down in his diaries and I found a whole, a whole history of um, love affairs, of um, incestuous relationships with his sisters, incestuous relationships with his children, sexual experiments with the family dog even, because Gill was very, very obsessed with sex and the functionings of the body. And these experiments um, were all noted down in this extraordinary, meticulous way in these diaries. He was, as one of his friends once said, mad about sex. He could never resist the opportunity. Even though the diaries were written 50 years prior, the criminal and amoral details listed throughout have led many to believe you cannot separate Gill's art from his depravities. And that knowledge of his terrible misdeeds undermines the aesthetic value of his work. I knew when I unearthed this material that if I wrote the biography that I felt I needed to write, bringing out all these um, aberrations of behavior, his sexual behavior, I was going to upset deeply a lot of the people who revered Gill most. The revelations of Gill's private life led to many critics calling for his work to be removed from public view. It was, they argued, impossible to appreciate his art, knowing it was produced by the same hands that abused his children. Art creations such as the 1923 print entitled Girl in the Bath were viewed in a very different light when learning it was in fact modelled on his 13-year-old daughter. And we're now more and more aware, aren't we, of the um, problems of child abuse, um, the terrible problems that affect so many people in such desperate ways. Uh, there is a resistance to looking at Gill's art with any seriousness um, once you know the details of his personal life, particularly the incest with his children. Um, and I understand what, where these people are coming from, but I certainly don't think that one can write off the wonderful work that he did because of things that one has to disapprove of in Gill's personal life. Despite campaigners wanting Gill's sculptures removed, his typeface has not been spurned in quite the same way, possibly because it's a less emotive or suggestive art form. It remains ubiquitous on modern word processing software and is still used by brands and businesses the world over. It is instead the flaws within the design of the lettering that's been the subject of modern scrutiny and criticism arguing that the sizing and shape of the typeface is not user-friendly. I've come to meet senior lecturer Ben Archer at the Leicester Print Workshop, who finds Gill's work slightly, well, mismatched. 
Ben, Gill described his work as foolproof. What's your take on it? Not quite foolproof. It's a less than ideal typeface made by an idealist. Johnston, as a calligrapher, was used to working uh, two dimensionally, you know, on the flat. Gill's got a more organic feel about the whole thing. Uh, his curves are very sensuous. That, I guess, is about him being a, a letter carver and a sculptor, working with his hands, moulding shapes, I think. But when examining similar shaped letters in Gill's alphabet, it highlights what some see as weaker elements to the design. Here we have uh, a lowercase l, a numeral 1 and an uppercase i. They're just all identical, aren't they? It must have been very confusing. The three i's, as we're now <laughs> calling them. So you could have something that looks like it's ill or it's a Roman three. You're not really to know. Although greatly inspired by Johnston, Gill did a lot of simplifying and refining to his letters. Johnston's numeral one here with its shaved sloping top is a lot more distinguishable from the flat top version of Gill's one or uppercase I and lowercase L. To critics like Ben, many of the issues he has with Gill's alphabets stem from how difficult they are to distinguish between each other. Take these lowercase letters of P, Q, D and B. When thrown together in a box of type, they are quite easy to mix up when they look pretty much the same upside down and back to front. For a typeface to a nation of shopkeepers, it's, it's quite a serious problem. For all that we know that one was taken the other as the inspiration, you know, they are very different things. And of course, their histories are leading in entirely different directions. Gilsons became this utilitarian, uh, quotidian sort of superface, the Helvetica of England. And Johnston was literally locked up and left underground for nearly a century, uh, you know, protected and, and not freely available. Even after their deaths, Johnston and Gill's creations were still subtly encapsulating Britain. By the middle of the 20th century, it was hard to miss either Johnston or Gill's typefaces. Johnston was entirely synonymous with London, from the tickets to the signage, the train liveries to the bus stops. But as the country approached the late 50s, the first cracks began to surface. Johnston's typeface in particular had a flaw. As London Transport demanded more from the text on their publicity, it forced printers and designers to push the boundaries. The Johnston typeface, designed for wood in the age of steam, was becoming unfit for purpose in the white heat of technology. London Transport needed it available in a much greater range of sizes. Because it was so inflexible, London Transport began using other typefaces for much of its printed material. For the first time in 30 years, timetables, adverts and posters were not set in Johnston. Printing technology was advancing rapidly and the old stalwarts of wartime and austerity were beginning to look a bit jaded. And even worse for Gil Sands, it was becoming a victim of its own success. Designers of the day were looking for something fresh. Gil Sands and Johnston were being shunned by the country, now replaced by more modern and chic designs. Typefaces like Helvetica became far more popular. Its letters were easier for printers to resize, and for Britain, entering its summer of love, it didn't have the connotations of wartime. Johnston and Gil Sands were now becoming just a little bit uncool, associated with officialdom, bossing people around, telling them where to go. But they weren't entirely dead. One London-born designer was about to create an album cover for the biggest pop group in the world. And he was kind of inspired by these big red beauties. OK, so the front cover of Abbey Road had no typography at all, 
but the back featured the road name in ceramic letters and the track listing was deliberately chosen by the designer John Kosh to be Gil Sands. Uh, I'm a Londoner. I guess I was influenced uh, without knowing it by Johnson because it's all around me, surrounding me, on um, buses that would go by, on the tube trains. Barred from using Johnston, which was exclusively owned and protected by London Transport, Kosh turned to Gil Sands. As a display space, I thought it was perfect for use, but I guess I didn't realise that until I got to art school, and we just started experimenting, and my favourite font was Gil. I didn't realise that uh, it had fallen out of fashion, to be honest. I just thought it was a great, legible typeface. John Kosh worked for Apple Records in the 1960s, where he was responsible for design and publicity. He was renowned for not letting the modern typeface trends of the day dominate his work. To be honest, I just started playing with in Helvetica in, when I, in my early days in design. Uh, it seemed to be too bland, but Gill somehow just was a great display face. Large, you can make it very stark, but for text with those ascenders and descenders, you could just really read it without eye strain. And on Abbey Road, it wasn't just the choice of an outdated typeface that gave it an unusual look. My claim to fame with Abbey Road was the fact that I did not display type of the Beatles on the cover or Abbey Road, uh, which caused a lot of consternation at the record company at the time. But if you notice that the lyrics and all the typography, they're all in Gill because it's very legible. And when we got round to Let It Be, Let It Be was just all Gill right from the start. The Beatles didn't know I was using Gill Sands or probably even really care. They didn't notice. They were totally oblivious to what fonts I was using. And it just was uh, in my homage, I think, to my background and the Beatles, you know, who came from Liverpool. <laughs> the Electric Light Orchestra, Aerosmith, the Eagles. All Kosh designs, all draped in Gil Sands. A typeface that was dying out in the 50s and 60s was now back. America seemed to be stuck on Futura. You know, Rod Stewart's coming over and ELO's coming over and a lot of my clients are coming over, Ringo. And I just wanted to make them feel at home somehow. They might not have known why. <laughs> but this, these are the fonts that they've grown up with or seen around them. When I see Gil Sands in other people's work and in my work, I just feel that there's a little thrill there that they've chosen the right font and the right face. So it, it goes without saying that uh, it, it has spread around the world. Gil Sands was slowly creeping back into British designs, now digitised by photo typesetting technology. By the 1980s, it was being used by many designers of the day. It was, of course, a decade where style was everything. The 80s was an interesting period. Uh, it was an amazing period to be in the middle of this huge explosion of new music, new fashion, new art, new design. And some of it was technologically driven. There was stuff we could do in the 80s that we just you just couldn't do in the 70s or the 60s. In the 80s, it became easier to change the size of type and graphics thanks to the benefits of computer-aided design. Neville Brodie spent much of the 1980s as the graphic designer for many of the cult magazines of the day, such as The Face and City Limits. Both of these adopted the clean elements of Gil Sands, but with a contemporary twist. We were able now to experiment with this on a regular level. We didn't need to be kind of highly trained type designers. We could instruct something to be 10% width, for instance. We bought this in the Face magazine. But particularly with City Limits, it was Guild that we were experimenting with. We felt we could just be exuberant and joyful and there was absolutely nothing to lose. I think Gil Sands became, again, representative of that kind of utopian idealism. Almost an optimistic belief in what culture could, could bring and society could bring. So 
brought that romantic hope for the future that was so absent in the rest of society. This is a really good example of your punching out your headlining yeah. gill. The idea really was how many variations could you get out of the same typeface without having to jump fonts. Mm. So you were wanting to stick with just the one typeface, but use it in as many different ways as possible. Absolutely. Wow. So here you have it kind of bold, wide spaced. Mm. Here you have it bold, condensed. Upper lowercase, here you have it bold, condensed, but wide spaced. So we're using it for so many different levels of articulation and information. Neville's typeface inspiration started from quite a young age. I came across this, a book from my childhood. It's an encyclopedia. And then realised that this was all gill. And it's gill at a kind of a supersized setting here. You wouldn't normally do this. So what they've done is they've recognised in gill the ability to punch out and articulate content. And I think that must have sat somewhere in, in the back of my mind. A typeface that once had unfashionable and authoritarian undertones was now being used against the establishment. It was even the typeface of choice on many of the anti-poll tax leaflets. It's interesting, isn't it, that uh, Gill is used quite a lot by generally left-wing or campaigning groups, but you don't see a lot of it used by anybody else. No, the hard right tend to avoid it completely for some strange reason, maybe because it has slightly softer or slightly more romantic connotations. Whilst Gill Sands was invading the country again, Johnston was being virtually annihilated in London. London Transport were using more contemporary-looking typefaces. Johnston's range of sizes was limited and not digitised for photo typesetting, making it impossible to use on a computer. What was once the go-to choice for a clear and concise design was now being substituted by other types, including Gil Sands. Fearful for Johnston's future, London Transport turned to design agencies to try and save it from a cruel death. It was a job that was entrusted to a young graphic designer called Eichi Kono, who needed a plan to digitise it for a computerised industry. Johnston uh, was originally uh, designed by uh, Edward Johnston for just display purpose, uh, station names but London Transport couldn't use for many different purposes um, when it's uh, small in size and then uh, it's not visible uh, uh, enough, readable enough. Aichi began painstakingly redesigning the typeface by hand. Every day I was drawing and, and then scratching it with a scalpel and retouching it. This process took Aichi around 18 months to complete. For the first time ever, Johnston was digitised for use on a computer. A typeface that was originally only available in a couple of weights now came in many more. Uh, so, altogether, I made eight different variations the light, medium, bold. Um, then, uh, when the typeface is reduced, in a six point or four point in a small size, it works uh, much better. And after the digitization was done, Johnston uh, survived again. New Johnston was born. It meant London Transport could continue to use it on tubes, buses, and signs. And also, Mayor of London started using it as an official typeface. So I'm very um, pleased, I'm proud of it, and I feel lucky. Still, I feel Johnston and Gil Sons both are absolutely uh, fantastic um, the humanist uh, sans serif, and uh, many other uh, similar ones uh, already come out, They're not really kind of, um, you know, surpass uh, their popularity. 
As New Johnston returned to the safety of its home, at the same time, Gil Sands was being repopularized as well. In fact, Gil was about to be the trusted typeface of choice for Britain's newest channel. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be able to say to you, welcome to Channel 4. The look of Channel 4 was created by designer Martin Lambinen. All of the channel's on-screen text and many of their printed adverts were all in Gil Sands. An ironic choice given that the logo was very much of a serif design. And yet, they worked so well together. And it appeared a contagious choice. Much of the television media also started switching to Gil Sands. It was concise and easy to read. In 1997, the BBC followed suit. They wanted a logo and a typeface style that would unify the entire corporation. Sound familiar? At this time, the BBC had a different logo for almost every TV and radio channel. A real mishmash of different designs. Something needed to be done. So they turned to the same man who helped stylise Channel 4. The BBC logo had got out of control. Just about anybody who had a budget in the BBC would commission a new logo. The main logo itself was made up of the four colour printing process. And so it didn't work in black and white. So not only did we have that problem, we had uh, sort of 180 different logo type types that the BBC was sort of using. So the entire identity of the BBC was being fragmented uh, uh, rather than strengthened. The old, tired BBC logo, set in an italic typeface, was becoming slightly hard to read at an angle. Martin Lambinen and his team were tasked with redesigning it, moving from a slant to a square. Quite frankly, the old logo just simply didn't work on television because it was, is, is sloping, and uh, the engineering of television is that. Uh, so it broke up. So we needed to create a, a logo type that was going to be technically better and, uh, and simpler. And I looked at Gill because of the association that Gill had with the BBC. And of course, all the sculptures around the, the building are his. I think the typeface brought a kind of simplicity to the channel. We were always aiming to keep things simple and clear. And, uh, and it is a very unfussy typeface, so it probably did emphasize that clarity. But this evolution of design continues today. Soon there will be a new type on the block. After 20 years, the process is happening all over again. The BBC plan to phase out Gil Sands and replace it with a new in-house typeface. One that has used Gil as an inspiration. So for me, it begs just one question. Why do they want to change it? Gil Sands was designed in the 1920s for the printed page. Online, it sort of falls down somewhat. It's not digitally optimised. It's not... It doesn't have great legibility when you look at long-form uh, journalism, for instance. So we needed to improve that area. And we currently license a number of fonts. We'd reduce that spend. We would own a typeface of our own. For the past two years, David and his team have been working on a new style of BBC lettering a typeface designed for the digital age. So, should we take a look at it? I'm very excited. So it's still a work in progress, but i um, desperate to show you. This is the new typographic look of the BBC. And you're getting a first glimpse at it now. It's still in production, but it's very exciting. That is absolutely beautiful, isn't it? It's so lovely to see these echoes of Gil Sands as well, on the S, for example. Like, this Q and the B without that little corner on them. 
And one of the things that um, our typographers talk about is the sort of Spartan elegance of Gil Sands. We've removed the spurs from these, which give it a real sort of friendly character. When you balance a B opposite the P, they're not identical. Yeah, there's definite echoes of where we've, where we've come from, from the heritage of Gill. On closer inspection of the new BBC design, there are several obvious changes that jump out when comparing it against Gill Sands. Gone are the perfectly circular O's and Roman-style quirky flourishes on the T's and G's. Now replaced with lettering that uses far greater spacing on screen. And no one's worried about the fact that it actually takes up more real estate on screen? Yes, yeah, but to tick all those legibility boxes, you have to make it breathe a bit wider. Right. For it to work in, say, a wearable or, or on tiny screens or whatever the future might hold. The spacing's wider, it's, it's bringing a better legibility, giving it a little bit more breathing space. It must feel quite exciting to be looking at all these wonderful new typeface ranges. It's, it's, it's incredibly exciting. It is so interesting to see this new BBC typeface in the flesh. But I can't help but wonder whether we've slightly lost some of the panache that Gil Sands brought to it. Who knows, maybe you'll be back in the future. After all, Gil Sands is the comeback king of all typefaces. For self-confessed design geeks like me, it is truly inspirational that these two classic British typefaces are still influential, still evolving, and still appropriate for modern times. Whether it's the past glories of the underground, cult album covers, or brand new designs, these two timeless British types are as important and relevant now as they were a century ago. Johnston and Gil Sands convey that sense of trust and tradition, quintessential British values, that no matter how turbulent the times, you'll get home safely. Just follow the signs. Coming up, queers. Ben Wishaw is a First World War soldier with a secret to tell in the first of a double bill of monologues from Mark Gatiss as part of Gay Britannia season next.